all. So we are starting with the second day of our uh, webinar on NMR spectroscopy. Our uh, first speaker is uh, Dr. Vinesh Vijayan from ISA Trivandrum. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome my friend and collaborator to this uh, webinar. So Dr. Vinesh obtained his master's from IIT Madras in 2002 and PhD from the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry, Gottingen, Germany, under the supervision of Professor Christian Griesinger. Dr. Vinesh continued as a postdoctoral fellow in the same institute, and he joined as a faculty member in ISA Trivandrum in 2010. Personally, he is an associate professor in the School of Chemistry, ISA Trivandrum. Dr. Vinish is a well-known NMR expert in state and solid state NMR. And his main area of research is the application of NMR spectroscopy to study the structure and dynamics of aggregating proteins. Dr. Vinish has published many research articles in high impact journals and gave many invited talks. Dr. Vinish guided many doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows. And he is an executive member, is the executive committee member of National Magnetic Resonance Society India and member of many other scientific bodies. I heartily welcome Dr. Vinesh Vijayan for speaking about NMR instrumentation. So I, I have a special request to the participants. Please turn off your mic and video during talk. Thank you for uh, the participation, uh, cooperation. Sha, please start. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sunil, for the kind introduction. Um, uh, I hope I am audible to everyone. Uh, yeah. I, I may be a fast speaker, so I try to be as slow as possible, but <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, if, if there are any questions, please put it on the chat. I, I just see my own screen, so I don't know. I'm basically talking to my screen, so it's very difficult to actually understand uh, or, or even uh, know the reactions on the participants' faces, reaction of the participants' faces for some of the things that I'm going to say. Um, so if there are doubts, I, I, I'm sure there will be doubts. Uh, you should uh, just uh, put it in the chat, so I will answer them after the uh, after the after the uh, uh, this one is over. Seminar is over. Um, so uh, the my topic is NMR instrumentation. Um, so this uh, NMR instrumentation I would definitely cover. Um, but I'm sure uh, Professor Madhu and Professor Chari might have talked to you about the basics. But um, I'll also do some basics of it, uh, just that uh, we are on the same page. Uh, I did not attend the previous lecture, so if, if you if you these if, if these are repeating, then uh, it just uh, goes on to reiterate um, some of the uh, difficult concepts in NMR. And which uh, mainly for BSc uh, or MSc students, uh, when we interview them in our for, for our integrated PhDs or PhD uh, uh, courses, uh, we find that many of the very basic concepts in an NMR or any any types of um, spectroscopy is missing. So uh, these are some very basic very basic concepts that uh, you probably should know uh, when attending some interviews. All right. Um, so I'll go. I'll go. I'll give you a basic uh, idea about what NMR uh, does and uh, how. Uh, I mean, not what NMR does, but uh, how we get NMR signal and uh, what are we really observing. Okay. Uh, and from there we go into uh, the actual instrumentation, uh, and that and then we end the talk. Okay. So, so this is how it is going to be. Um, so, uh, first of all, I start with something that is very basic because I start that everybody has passed plus two, so they should know hydrogen atom, right? So, uh, uh, so the hydrogen atom, uh, when you know the hydrogen atom, you see these orbitals, nice orbitals here, yes, P and uh, B orbitals, but um, what is interesting is that uh, these are mathematical con uh, uh, concepts of these, uh, you know, these are drawn uh, from a mathematical functions, right? And uh, these mathematical functions is what we call an orbital. Uh, now, how do we define these orbitals? These are defined by the uh, 
by the quantum numbers. These are the principal quantum number, the azimuthal or the angular momentum quantum number, then the magnetic quantum number. Now I I went into I just I was looking for something and I, I yesterday I was uh, looking through the YouTube channels and uh, many of the people they are in Hindi in um, uh, English in I don't know there are Malayalam uh, NMR channels but there are people who teaches you NMR students or um, postdoc I mean I don't know who who teaches but they are <clears throat> very eloquent teachers but they are they make very basic uh, mistakes when uh, doing it now. What I wanted to emphasize here is that there is a principal quantum number, there is azimuthal, and there is magnetic quantum number. These are numbers, you know. These are numbers, okay. Uh, and um, when if you if you freeze everything, you know, you take hydrogen atom, you say that the you go into very low temperature, then we can say that okay, the hydrogen atom, the first the electron on the hydrogen atom uh, will be in one as orbital. Okay, will always be found in one orbital. All right, so you can very specifically say that it is the n is equal to one, l is equal to zero, right? Uh, and that would be one orbital. But the same way, so you have this principal quantum number, and you have azimuthal, and then the magnetic quantum number. So then there comes the oh, there is some sound coming from somewhere. Um, then there is the uh, uh, then then there is the spin quantum number. Okay, but these are numbers. Spin quantum number. They are numbers that comes out of the quantization. Okay, quantization solving um, uh, Schrodinger equation for hydrogen atom. Okay, these are numbers. These are not really, not really. The origin doesn't really lie in motion because any motion, if it freezes to zero Kelvin, put to zero Kelvin, then it should cease to exist. But does spin stop existing at that uh, temperature? Right. The spin still continue. The, the, the spin quantum number of electron is still half, right? The spin, spin quantum number of electron is still half. It will not move. And it is not plus or minus half. It is half. Spin quantum number is half. What is plus or minus one? Uh, plus or minus half? That is the uh, that is the magnetic component of the spin or the uh, the z component of the spin quantum number. Z component of the spin angular momentum. That is plus or minus half. Is a component. When you say what is the spin of an electron, that is always half, okay. And when you uh, when you say uh, uh, when you then what is plus or minus half? That is the is a component of the spin angular momentum, okay. So um, when when we teach or when anybody teaches uh, um, NMR, we start with the angular momentum, the angular momentum. But this L here is the orbital angular momentum. That is not spin angular momentum, okay. This L here is the orbital angular momentum. This is because of the orbits. It's not because of the spin. It's the orbit. The spin and the or orbit are different. This, the, this is the orbital angular momentum. And this ML, the component of the L, which is in the Z, Z direction. So this L, angular momentums are, of course, vector quantities, right? So if you... Um, if you go uh, into detail, so the Z component, so you write a vector um, which has a direction, uh, 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 which has a magnitude and direction. Now this L will give you the magnitude of that angular momentum and ML will give you the Z component of that uh, angular momentum. You will not be, because why, why are we not specifying Y or Z component? Because you will not be able to uh, simultaneously determine them because of uncertainty principle. Okay, so because of uncertainty principle, we can only determine the uh, magnitude of the angular momentum, which is equal to root of L into L plus one H cross, where H cross is H over two pi. And uh, we can also determine the Z component of the angular momentum. Again, these are orbital angular momentum. These are orbital angular momentum. Now, when you come to spin, Spin also behaves because it is again the origin of spin is a quantum mechanical uh, quantum mechanical origin. They don't have a physical existence. Okay, you cannot physically represent spin. Okay, but what we can always relate to is the angular momentum. How it behaves? How it behaves? It behaves like a angular momentum, like uh, like these or, or the, um, orbital angular momentum that we just described, L and ML. Okay, so spin is like an angular momentum. So when you say spin, that is why they, they are impartially, they, all these YouTube people are also partially right when they say, okay, they, there is a motion because oh, angular momentum is always associated with some kind of motion, okay? But it's not really, right? Because when you freeze it to zero, 
uh, Kelvin, you still have spin. Okay, so uh, the, if it is a motion, which is if the origin is from a motion, then it should have ceased to exist. That is why when I said that uh, it's, it's you have to make that uh, differentiation. Right. So uh, um, the there is the spin uh, spin uh, quantum number which behaves or we have its uh, actual physical um, um, interpretation that it behaves like an angular moment. It's like an angular moment. It is not an angular moment. It is like an angular moment because it's not always uh, has similar uh, scaling factor as the as when it comes when it's put into a magnetic field. Now, when we in, when it comes to L and ML, we said this is magnetic quantum number, right? This is a magnetic quantum number. Why do you say it's magnetic quantum number? Because without a magnet, all these values, for example, if you take the two p orbital where L is equal to one, there is minus one, zero, and one. There are three basic orbitals: p, x, p, y, and p, z, uh, denoted by minus one. Of combination of minus one and one and zero, right? So zero is a p zero orbital plus uh, will give you p x minus will give you minus one and one, right? So uh, that is the uh, uh, three degenerate. We call it degenerate because they have the same energies. But when you put it in a magnetic field, you put it in a magnetic field or electric field, then uh, they don't. All these three orbitals don't have the same energy. They will be split. Okay, uh, uh, split in energy minus one, zero, and one. So they will be split in energy. Okay, now that is why it's called a magnetic quantum number because its existence can be only seen when you put it in a magnetic field, right? So that is why it's called a magnetic quantum number. Spin also has something similar. So spin angular momentum behaves like L. Let's say S is the spin uh, spin of an electron, and um, uh, that will behave like L. The like these things. The only difference is that will be half integer, not uh, uh, not like uh, integers, like zero, one, zero, and two. Spin quantum number is just half, right? And then the z component of the spin that can be either uh, up, which is called the plus half, or down, which is called the minus half. So plus half and minus half. These are the two digits. There are two s plus one degenerate state. Here there are two l plus one degenerate state for a single l for the s. Uh, spin, there is two s plus one m s values, m s values um, uh, that is possible. Okay, so uh, these are the possibilities uh, for your spin angle order. And how do we represent them? This is this is what is important. Uh, uh, how do we represent them? This is the classic pictures that we see. So this is your s. Okay, you can see this s. Okay, now I said that we cannot understand what is a projection along Y or what is a projection along X. So these are the, what are the axes? This is the Z axis, this is the Z axis, this is the Y axis, and this is the X axis. Okay, now this is a vector of the spin quantum number, uh, spin angular momentum. So the, the magnitude of that vector would be root of SD to S plus one H cross. Okay, and the projection of that in the Z. So this part, whoops, uh, uh, this part, this part is uh, um, uh, plus half H cross. And uh, if if it was uh, uh, not in the positive quadrant, if it is in the negative quadrant, the S is in the negative quadrant, you will have minus half H cross. Okay, so that is the only two possibilities. These are the two degenerate levels for a spin S. Um, we cannot determine. We cannot determine the projection along y. We cannot determine the projection along uh, x because um, uh, they don't commute or they they don't. Uh, they are not. Um, they, uh, they are forbidden by uncertainty principle to simultaneously determine. So that is why we we give this conic picture because this s can be anywhere in this cone. If, if, if I say that S is in this direction, I mean, if, if it is in the positive quadrant, that means that the uh, 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 the projection of S along the uh, in the Z axis would be half H cross plus half H cross. And, uh, but I don't know about Y and X. So it can be anywhere in this uh, quadrant, okay? Because uh, this is not, this is only the, the, the first quadrant, right? But it can be here in the second quadrant. Uh, so that is also possible. Right, so it is possible to go along this. Now, if I say my S is um, uh, in the negative part, and so hence the projection would be minus half H cross, then it will be in this quadrant. So that is why you have these 
cones that I uh, that that is always uh, represented when you have angular momentum, right? So uh, these are the possible uh, things, and that is why we we represent like this. You know, this this there is a tilt. You know, what is why there is a tilt because you know exactly what is the angle here. Okay, what will be the angle because you know the hypotenuse. You will have one of the sides, so you should be able to figure out what is the angle. So that is why you have a tilt. We, we represent spin like this, right? So this is one very basic things that uh, people uh, or our students should know when we uh, uh, talk about spin and uh, spin of electrons or nucleus. Now, coming to nucleus, nucleus is also uh, is made up of uh, uh, particles and um, uh, subatomic particles, and that, that has protons and neutrons, and they themselves have spins. Um, uh, uh, the uh, proton spin is when I say proton spin is again quantum number of proton spin is uh, half, and also neutron has half, and uh, they fill up the nuclear energy levels. Okay, they fill up the nuclear energy levels, and finally, like how you calculate spins of uh, transition metals and things like that, you fill up all the electrons and find out how many unpaired electrons are there. That will be the spin of the uh, metal, right? So uh, here in the nuclear uh, uh, spins in an atom, you just uh, 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 fill up. I mean, you just meaning that you have to know what are the energy levels and what is ordering of energy levels in uh, transition metals and all the ordering of electron energy levels. We know we know SPDF and uh, how it has to be off pop principle, Hans rule, all this uh, Pauli's exclusion principle, all this through those uh, uh, these rules we should be able to fill up these electrons and find the unpaired electrons and find the spin of the uh, metal. But when it comes to nucleus, we have to know how the nuclear energy levels are filled up. And uh, but we, I'm not going to details how nuclear energy levels are going to be filled up. You have to try nuclear uh, nuclear chemistry or nuclear physics. And uh, then basically, what happens? You fill it just like your uh, again because these are uh, uh, these are fermions. They will have to obey Pauli's exclusion principle. And uh, you cannot have two uh, uh, nucleus having the same uh, two nucleons. That means proton and neutrons having the same. Um, uh, 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 quantum numbers, so it has to be spilled in the opposite direction. Okay, so finally you have to find out how many unpaired nucleons are there, and and you add it up, and that will be your spin of the nucleus. Okay, so that is why carbon thirteen is half, carbon um, proton is half because it has it's a single proton. I mean proton meaning hydrogen atom. The nucleus of hydrogen atom, the spin quantum number is half because it has only a proton, and I told this, which is half. Uh, and uh, that is also uh, uh, nitrogen 14 is one because again that there are two of them uh, uh, which is unpaired so that will uh, uh, there is a, there is a, there is a dis there is some disturbance um, okay so um, half and that is why you get that and so once we know once we understand the uh, once we know the spin of a uh, nucleus, well, the spin of the nucleus, then it is good. Um, I, I told you uh, if the magnetic quantum number, right, you have to put it in a magnetic field, then there is a magnetic uh, uh, splitting. Now, why is that splitting? It's because of the magnetic moment. Okay, now how is magnetic moment? Because a magnetic field requires, it will interact with the magnetic moment. Now, uh, does this uh, spin has a magnetic moment? That magnetic moment here, this mu is equal to gamma, which is a scaling factor gamma uh, s, which is a spin of the nucleus. Okay, so mu is equal to gamma s. Now, only if you if the mu is non-zero, if mu the magnetic moment is non-zero, then it will have an interaction with the uh, magnetic field. If the mu is zero, then there is no interaction between the magnetic field and uh, and the and your nucleus, and you will not have an MR. So the mu has to be non-zero in order for an MR to happen. So when is mu not not equal to zero? When s is not equal to zero. So when the nucleus is not zero, when the nucleus is uh, when nucleus spin is non-zero, then you can do an MR with it. Okay. So that is the whole idea. Carbon twelve, unfortunately, half a s. Is equal to zero. The spin of the carbon twelve is zero, and therefore your magnetic moment is going going to zero, and there is no NMR for it, right? So uh, you cannot have it. 
Anyway, um, what we are going to, what uh, generally people study is spin half nucleus, like electron has spin half. The, 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 if you take the periodic table of, um, of elements, uh, every element has a nucleus. So uh, the, 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 the most important um, elements or, or the NMR of elements we study are for spin half, which is basically that you, um, proton, uh, that is hydrogen atom, uh, hydrogen nucleus, uh, carbon-13 nucleus, uh, and nitrogen-15 nucleus, uh, uh, 19F nucleus, that is fluorine, which is highly abundant, um, and uh, 31P phosphorus, which is also um, the natural occurring phosphorus. Um, so these are the spin half nuclei in which we study in detail. There are, of course, other uh, nuclei uh, of spin one and above, which can also be studied, but it's slightly more difficult to study them because of something else uh, that we will discuss tomorrow. Anyway, so uh, we will basically deal with the spin half uh, nuclei, spin half nuclei. Um, so here, when, you, when the spin is half, then the, there is magnetic moment, and that will interact with the magnetic field. Okay, so you have to put magnetic field, and mag so you have to have a magnetic moment, then it will interact with the magnetic field. This interaction is called the Zeeman effect. Okay, this interaction is the Zeeman effect, and uh, we need to have a Zeeman splitting. Right, so uh, I was talking about neutron, and uh, this is not required. So how neutrons are formed and how protons are formed, but they are in themselves made up of uh, quarks, and they themselves are spins, and uh, how they are arranged is uh, not really. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, this is what uh, I said. How we we should know uh, about um, uh, about how it's filled, but we can have an empirical uh, knowledge of whether it is a half integer, that means half three by two, uh, five by two, and things like that, or integer like zero, one, um, uh, two, three, four, like that, uh, by just looking at the atomic mass and atomic number. So if it's um, a half integer would be possible if you have a odd. Uh, Odd, odd atomic mass and atomic numbers, uh, like you have the hydrogen or um, nine, uh, uh, fluorine and things like that. Uh, half integer is also possible if you have odd atomic mass and uh, even atomic uh, number, like carbon-13. Uh, then you, uh, what is interesting, and if, if it is integer, then atomic mass has to be even and atomic number has to be odd, okay? Atomic mass has to be even, atomic number has to be, so nitrogen-14 should be, uh, even because um, atomic mass is uh, even 14 and uh, atomic number is seven, which is an odd number. So you have spin one. You don't know exactly whether it is one, three, or uh, five, but uh, uh, but still uh, we can say that it would be whether it is half integer or integer. Now, what is more interesting? We should be worried. Uh, we should know that if, if the atomic mass and atomic numbers are both even like carbon 12, for example, uh, both is six and 12. So atomic mass and atomic numbers are both even, then it is zero, there is no NMR, okay? Zero. So if your I, the spin quantum number I is zero, the, uh, then there is no NMR, we can't do NMR. So this is most uh, more important, even, even. All others possible, even, even, not possible for NMR. Okay, so, um, so you have to put, so it's, if it is a spin half, it is a di it has a dipole because um, the the way uh, the spin half particle is then it it can, it has a uh, dipole moment and this dipole moment can be represented that is why people uh, represent it as bar magnet but this is only true for a spin half uh, nuclear okay this bar magnet analogy will not work for other nuclei uh, so uh, spin uh, spin half then it can be represented as a bar magnet. Okay, and then uh, when you put it in a magnetic field, many of them align, or many of them will not align. Okay, we call anything above spin half is quadrupole. It has multiple poles. I mean, multiple meaning more than multiple. This two dipole is also a two poles. You can't have monopole, right? So uh, this is a dipole, um, but uh, for a spin half. But if it's the spin is greater than spin quantum number is greater than half, then we call them. Quadrupole. That means there are multiple poles in your uh, multiple uh, uh, poles in your uh, uh, nucleus. Okay. So anyway, we deal with spin half, as I told you, and this can be represented as uh, this bar magnets. And when you apply a magnetic field, it can be either aligned with the field or against the field. And uh, what we happened is that this splitting, this energy splitting, because of degeneracy, 
region will see is lifted when you put it in a magnetic field. And the splitting depends on the applied magnetic field here. Okay, so if the if the uh, if the applied magnetic field is uh, low, then the this uh, this uh, the splitting is small. When it is becoming higher, like seven point four one Tesla, then it becomes really big. Okay, now we have to imagine what is one point four one Tesla. You know, the Earth's magnetic field is around sixty micro Tesla, or maximum you can reach uh, on the surface is sixty micro Tesla. While here it's one point four one Tesla. That is a crore difference, uh, a crore uh, away, ten uh, um, ten million uh, thing, uh, ten million times uh, bigger is the magnetic field of the normal. This is 1.41 Tesla is the biggest MRI magnets that you can have. 7.41 Tesla would be a 300 megahertz. Eh? Uh, so, uh, NMR. So, that is the how the difference is. So, we are, if you go into an MRI, you are in this Tesla. How strong the magnetic field is there compared to Earth's magnetic field. Uh, and 7.41 Tesla, the, the, the magnetic field um, uh, felt by the nucleus in of your organic molecules. That is around 7.4 Tesla. So that is at least 10 million high, times higher than the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, or at least in our terms, one crore times. Yeah. Okay, so how is the splitting? The splitting is depending very clearly. This graph shows you that the split depends, splitting depends on the uh, magnetic field and that you see here, right? You see these magnetic fields here. You can find out what is the interaction energy, which is the magnetic moment. Uh, is a dot product of magnetic moment and uh, magnetic field. Uh, and we say we only apply the magnetic field. It's not like uh, two uh, directions we are applying. The magnetic field, uh, we apply the magnetic field only in one direction. And that direction we say is a Z axis, okay? And so uh, we use the Z component, which is why this plus half and minus half comes in, right? And then we find the difference in energy. Okay, and that you see is depending on this gamma is a scaling factor, and this scaling factor depends on the nucleus. That what type of nucleus you are, um, what is the nucleus you are going to look at? Whether it is a, a hydrogen atom, whether it is carbon atom, then this gamma will be different. Okay, uh, H cross is a uh, universal constant, which is uh, H over two pi, the Planck's constant divided by two pi. B zero is the magnetic field in Tesla. So if you, uh, if you if you have this delta E, we can equate to H nu, the, uh, um, uh, the relation between frequency and energy, and then find out the angular frequency, which is gamma B0, okay? Gamma B0, it's basically div division by H cross. Uh, so, uh, so gamma B0. So this will be the frequency required. If, if you're in, a, in any spectroscopy, what are we observing? What are we doing? If you have studied IR spectroscopy, you see that is that is vibrational um, energy levels, vibrational energy levels, and um, and uh, uh, going from a lower energy vibrational level to a higher energy vibrational uh, energy level requires you to supply radiation. And what radiation are you supplying? You, are, you have to supply the difference in those uh, 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 difference in that uh, uh, difference in the frequency. Of the energy levels, right? And uh, that comes out, that turns out to be in the, uh, the IR region of your electromagnetic spectrum. Now, for NMR, this splitting, we said big splitting with this uh, high Tesla magnetic field, this splitting is very compared to IR or uh, rotational or uh, uh, electronic state, these are very, very minute. Uh, the spin, especially spin, spin. Uh, energy, uh, spin energy levels of a nucleus is really, really minute. Therefore, we look at the farthest end of the electromagnetic spectrum, which has the least energy, okay? And that comes out to be the radio waves, okay? The same radio waves that we use for our communication using our mobile phones, right? The same thing that we uh, use for our um, what we see right now, right? So this is the important part. This we use the radio waves. The radio waves are used to excite nucleus, uh, which is in the lower energy state, lower spin energy state to a higher energy. Nuclear energy levels are really huge. Nuclear energy levels are really huge. Nuclear spin energy levels are very, very small. Okay, very, very small, and they come in the radio waves rate because there the, the frequency of radio waves are in megahertz or uh, kilohertz, right? And um, and we have seen in our uh, uh, FM, 93.5 FM, 
uh, 94.7 FM. This just tells you that how much of megahertz is there. 93.5 megahertz is what they are, they are transmitting their FM radio on, right? Uh, so we we are dealing with 500 megahertz. So it's uh, it's a, a factor of, uh, uh, a factor higher. That's all. Okay. So that is the frequency that we need in order to kick the nucleus in a low energy state to high energy state. Okay, so uh, let's go a bit faster now. Now, uh, after so the, basically what we have, we have this pin which is going up because now it is in the low energy state. That if you have a magnetic field in this direction, then you absorb radio frequency, you go down. This is what the classic absorption spectroscopy is. Yeah? Absorption spectroscopy. Okay. Now, um, uh, of course, this is uh, this is we are not dealing with single spins. Always remember that we are not dealing with single spins. We have huge amount of spins in your sample. Okay, huge Avogadro number. If you have one molar sample of of uh, H2O, then you have one six point uh, six point zero two three into ten raised to twenty three molecules of water molecule in that uh, NMR sample. So that means twice of that because you two they have two hydrogens, right? Forget about the oxygen. Uh, so, so much of uh, spins will be there, and uh, we have to deal in a different way. So, one good thing about quantum mechanics is that when you have such a large uh, amount of uh, sample, then we can uh, we can actually treat them classically. Okay, it's called the ergodic principle. Uh, we can teach them, uh, we can treat them classically, and that is an easy way of in this uh, in, in in lecture to do it. So um, as I told you, this this line here is the magnetic moment because that will be in the direction of the uh, spin magnetic momentum, which is only a scaling factor. Remember, I can replace this mu mu is equal to gamma s. So there is only a scaling factor on mu. It behaves exactly like your spin quantum number. So okay, so that is why there is a con here also. Eh? You remember this is con. So this there is a con. If you have a large number of spins, it can be here, 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 any place, right? Eh? Up, down. But always on the cord, always on the cord, okay? Uh, and it is going to have a torque, which is, is equal to mu. If you put it in a magnetic field, this magnetic moment will, is going to have a torque. And that is why this will also process like that. This precession is what we see in the uh, uh, top, the uh, bumper, uh, uh, top that we see, you know, what, what is there? In place of uh, mu, that will be the angular momentum, and b, it will be the gravity, okay? And that will make it process. So you have the top going like that. The top is spinning around its own axis, but then it will start wobbling like that, okay? It will start wobbling like that. That is the precession. So our guy, uh, our spin also is going to process around the magnetic field. So a single, uh, single, uh, single spin, okay? It is going to go, go around the magnetic field. But the major problem is we have a large number of spins, right? So we have no idea where in this cone these spins are going to be, okay? Where in this cone the spins are going to be. It will be either in this cone or it will be either in this cone. Have a magnetic field along this direction, okay? Now, the uh, the problem is that you you have the X and Y. We have no idea about X and Y, the component along X and Y. We can only say that it will be along this cone. Now, one good thing is that the X and Y component is going to get canceled out because we have large number of spins, right? We have large number of spins. So if you have a spin in this direction or mu in this direction, there is always a possibility you can have another mu in this direction also. So what happens? You are, uh, the X and Y component of this mu will be along this axis and this, uh, this axis, so minus Y and minus X axis, while for this, it will be in the positive Y and positive uh, X axis. So they are going to cancel out each other. So we assume what is called a random phase. We assume that there is a random phase of these spins. So what is what is that uh, um, uh, this assumption does? It, it, or it's a very good assumption. It does this because there is a large number of spins. Is that that you will only have the x and y component are going to cancel out. For example, this. Uh, spin x and y component is going to cancel out with this spins s and x and y component because they are in the minus y and minus x axis while for this it is plus y and plus x axis so they are going to cancel out so if you have large number of spins we say that all the x and y component are going to cancel out both in this direction and this direction and the remaining what is getting added up what is getting added up is the uh, uh, is that component 
that goes in this direction okay the z component that is in this direction so only the z component gets added up now of course there is there, there are spins in the negative z component so you have also minus uh, there is also a magnetic moment here but then most of if you you if you have studied um, uh, uh, spectroscopy you should know that most of your spins will be or a large number of spins will be in the uh, in the lower energy state or that or that which will be aligned with the magnetic field so in this direction the m0 the the sum of the total m uh, mu uh, in the is a direction we call the m0 will be higher so that will be the direction the magnetic moment the actual magnetic moment remains and that calculation that vector addition is given here so that m0 is what is this is is this okay this m0 that you're going to calculate depends on n which is the number of nu uh, nuclei or number of um, of basically concentration gamma which is the geomagnetic ratio the b0 which is the magnetic field and inversely proportional to the temperature so how are you going to get m0 high we put a lot of your sample so the concentration has to be higher your gamma has to be higher but, but that is basically de uh, decided by the nucleus so what you should do we should try to detect on uh, on uh, on uh, nucleus which are high which has high gamma and uh, fortunately for us proton in the whole periodic table proton has the highest gamma proton meaning hydrogen at uh, nucleus of hydrogen atom has the highest gamma so that is why we actually detect your signal and of course you have to detect at a very high magnetic field very high magnetic field okay now why do we have to detect at very very high magnetic field because this difference between this m0 and this m0 will only happen if your energy difference is very high okay if you can get otherwise what happens this m0 is going to go down if the energy difference is not so much there will be lot of these spins in bottom okay here i am representing three compared to like uh, seven here right so this is not the case you have to, you have to you have to think about avogadro number but let's say there is a seven on the lower energy state and three in the high energy state so you have a net up z direction but but if your energy gap is smaller then the few of them will go down so this m0 is going to reduce huh? okay so energy gap is going to reduce because there are there is a more chance that the in the in the uh, temperature uh, the, the the thermal energy is sufficient to excite this uh, uh, spin to a high energy state if the energy gap is smaller the energy gap is basically decided by b0 okay and the gamma of course but the gamma is set by the nucleus by b0 is something that we have okay and that is the reason why we we try to uh, do all our nmr or if you want to have sensitivity we try to do it in a higher magnetic field right so this is we we uh, have the um, uh, the magnet this is the magnet that is wound out like magnetic coil okay and uh, you see the b uh, this is where the sample comes in and there is another coil this is the radio frequency coil okay this is the magnet coil which is a superconducting magnet coil and this is the radio frequency coil and the radio frequency is like compress this radio frequency into very very small uh, duration like this which is called a pulse in microseconds these are going to be a microsecond pulse okay so um oops did i do something ah uh, ah uh, uh, this is a uh, microsecond pulse microsecond pulse this, this duration would be microseconds the what we do is we 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 pass this frequency frequency we have to be on the carrier frequency of the magnet okay this is gamma b0 okay so if you have protons it will be gamma if if it is uh, for example uh, uh, 9.4 tesla that means 400 megahertz then it is 9.4 tesla multiplied by the gamma of proton in that frequency we have to supply and that supply we pass it through a gating mechanism where at any point of time it will be zero and then suddenly you increase it so it will go up like that and then you close the gate and then it remains like that so this is a pulse this is a pulse a short burst of radiation okay now what it does is that it will not be exactly 500 or 400 megahertz it will be just 400 megahertz plus few to uh, few kilohertz okay because of this pulsing technique uh, 
this uh, this the profile of this pulse would be a sync function. This is a step function. Now, if you Fourier transform this, Fourier transform this because this is a time domain, no time versus amplitude. Uh, Fourier transform. I probably should uh, have studied from the previous lectures uh, what is Fourier transform does. Fourier transform does is to take a time domain signal into a frequency domain. So if you do a Fourier transform of this, that is a frequency profile of this pulse would be. You would be centered around 400 megahertz, but then we'll have some um, uh, uh, deviation from 400 megahertz. You have a pulse. Uh, you have a. Uh, I cannot write it here, and that is the worst thing. To do. Uh, you will have a, uh, a sync function. You have a sync function. Uh, if you don't know the sync function, it's it's sine x over x. Okay, so it will be a sync function. If you can plot it out in the uh, Wolfram Mathematica and things like that, you get a sync function, and that is a uh, that that means you have you, you it's not a single frequency that comes out you have a bunch of frequency that comes out okay that is probably the popular uh, thing right olden days we used to do uh, the, the continuous wave radiation uh, irradiation but now we do Fourier transform or we basically do pulse rate of, uh, uh, NMR where uh, the sensitivity is much higher then the continuous wave, the problem with continuous wave was that yet you have to scan the entire thing. So you go from one, like in this piano, you have to go from one uh, key stroke to the last key stroke. Then you have to come back again. You have to wait till the uh, magnet is, uh, till the spin has relaxed back. And then you have to come back and then do the entire thing again. Okay. But that is a whole problem. That's, uh, because we don't know where the frequency is. No, we, we, we don't know where the, uh, uh, where the signal is. But in uh, Fourier transform, we just use this pulsing technique. It will excite the entire region. And then you can scan very fastly. You can. You have to just wait for the spins to come back and then again pulse. Then you have to do uh, again do the entire, uh, I mean, uh, scan again. So Fourier transform is much, much faster and much um, sensitive than continuous. Right, I'm not uh, going to talk here. So what we do, uh, uh, here, I cannot. Yeah, so you have seen this. Uh, 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 what is this? Uh, this signal. Uh, this is M zero. This red uh, thing is M zero. And um, if you apply a radio frequency, the radio frequency has to be applied perpendicular. Okay, in this uh, thing, you have you, you have seen this magnetic field is along this direction, which is called the B zero field. Okay, which is a B zero field. Which is a B zero field and the RF field, which is coiled in this direction, that will be perpendicular to the field. Okay, this is how it should be. Okay, only then we should be able to see. That is why after the discovery of spin, it took some time before we actually detected NMR. Okay, we spin could have, could be detected, but NMR could not be detected. So what we have to do? We have to apply a radio frequency or radio frequency pulse. Along so this is M zero, which is the magnetic field direction, and this is going to be, uh, this is going to be the RF uh, field. Now you have to apply a radio frequency in the x or y direction. Now what happens? We will just see. When you apply the radio frequency, the magnetic moment is going to come down here and then starts going around, going around. Okay, and you will see that it is going up also slightly up slightly, see it's going up also, it's a 3D, uh, it's going up also slightly. Now, if there is a coil, because you, you apply a pulse, you basically stop the pulse, and what happens, this coil is there, this magnetic moment is going around, around and around, it is cutting this coil, creating a current, which is what we are going to observe, this is the current. Now, since it is going up, the current is, Reducing. So at first it is the high current and then it starts reducing. Okay. Why is why it has an oscillating? Because this guy is going around and around and around. That is why it is oscillating like that. Right. So this oscillation is because this oscillation is because this this guy was going around and around and around and, and going up. So there is a decay also. Okay. This is called the FID and Fourier transform of this gives you the uh, Fourier transform of this gives you the frequency. This this, for example, 
this for example is amplitude versus time amplitude versus time is now good for any spectroscopy so what we need is amplitude versus frequency so how do you get amplitude versus time to amplitude versus frequency is to do a fourier transform that converts any reciprocal spaces that interconverts any reciprocal spaces okay so in uh, x ray crystallography that is what reciprocal uh, space to actual space we do Uh, Fourier transform. Now, how do we do it? Reality, we what we call it digitizes. Where there is an analog to digital converter, which basically digitizes all those points. Okay, we take these points. Okay, of this digital, you can also see small, small points. Huh? Uh, I just made it into bigger ones. Huh? So these are points, and then we take them. We we know exactly where these points are. You can then uh, uh, use mathematics or any other tool. Uh, in nmr we have uh, talks been geol should have its own um uh, software to do fourier transform it's one step thing to do it okay you do a fourier transform which will give you the frequency okay this is this is this fourier transform also helps in de basically it is a deconvolution method huh? you have multiple frequencies the previous slide here this is just for a single frequency this is an fid that was generated in mathematica and uh, if you do a fourier transform you get a single peak but if you have multiple frequencies then the fid pre induction dk is would look like this so for a transform would give you multiple things uh, you saw that in our animation that it was going up the the going up rate of going up is uh, called the longitudinal relaxation time longitudinal relaxation time there are two basic relaxation one is the longitudinal relaxation which is the slowest relaxation time okay and that is why before each scan we have to wait a very long period uh, in seconds before we can actually start uh, pulsing again okay pulsing again so longitudinal relaxation time uh, basically determines your inter scan delay inter scan delay now um, uh, there is another which is very important is the transverse relaxation time if you have multiple spins in your system it will relax uh, it will be coherent there's a coherent i mean when you apply a pulse all the it's like um, it's like broomstick you know the spins are like uh, broomsticks uh, broom i mean you know broom you you have a broom you no know? in kerala i don't know in kerala we have this broom with uh, coconut uh, uh, coconut st uh, sticks eh? coconut sticks okay and uh, it is tied with a rope it it is tied with a rope now uh, when you have, when you have a pulse then all of the, the the rope is like a pulse it holds all the spins together and put it to z axis it goes and puts it to the x or y axis now because the pulse has stopped that means you untie the uh, untie the uh, uh, the the uh, rope what happens the broomstick dissipates no no it will it will it will be all over the place putting putting it back together is a, you have to put uh, you have to forcefully put it back together it is possible in nmr also it is possible to put it, put it back together again but then it will uh, dissipate okay this dissipation how fast it gets dissipated is given by the time uh, and it is also depending on the uh, how fast it tumbles and everything and uh, that is given by the transverse relaxation time t2 okay so if you have uh, so what 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 the how does it manifest in the nmr spectra it manifests in the line width in the line width okay so uh, uh, if you have very uh, fast relaxing then you will have a uh, or what is called a short t2 very fast relaxing that means your time is very short uh, in the in the uh, so it's very f fast relaxing that means the time of coherence is very short so that means that uh, you will get a very broad signal so this is the fid right very fast relaxation so you get a very broad signal if it is uh, long t2 that means your fid is really long uh, long t2 or slow relaxing slow relaxation then you will have a sharp signal okay the line width basically is determined by delta nu line width line width at half height uh, is 1 over pi t2 star okay 1 over pi t2 the t2 is the transverse relaxation time this depends on the size of the molecule uh, yeah. it also depends on paramagnetic uh, things and things like okay i don't want to go into detail on how how nmr signals are uh, if you want i can tell you if you really require the mathematics of it i can tell you tomorrow huh? uh, just let me know so this is basically how nmr signals uh, you know analytically you can do a fourier transform and find 
the real part you only take the real part which will be the laurentian signal and uh, you don't do that you may you you uh, neglect the imaginary part and the imaginary part is a dispersive signal and this is the absorptive signal that you're going to get okay now we come to the actual uh, thing which is the uh, the instrumentation the first thing we should know is uh, how a sample tube is now this is a sample tube i don't know how many of you actually seen an mr but this is uh, uh, this is what this the would be the first uh, introduction point where you actually see a sample tube okay we are talking about solution in mr not solid state in mr so solution in mr so you have this sample tube he uh, the the top of this will be like this the bottom will be like this okay so it is closed off on the top by this cap here okay bottom is like round now you have to fill up to 5 cm 5 huh? cm or around 500 microliters 500 microliters of sample sample and how do we do that this is called a spinner and this is a, a depth gauge okay you put it into a spinner and put it into a depth gauge and there are markings here and this sample tube should be exactly in between the sample should be exactly in between Okay, sample height is here. It says four centimeter, but five centimeter you should be really good. Okay, and fill it with as much as concentration as possible. Okay, then you get a very good and a massive signal. Right. So this is what a sample. This is a standard sample tube. There are many other sample tubes. You have. You can have pressure uh, tubes. We can have uh, uh, tubes for protein uh, NMR and things like that. So there are other sample where we don't, we can't have 500 uh, microliters. You no know, proteins, for example, we cannot express so much of protein. So we have to do it with very lit little. But then the uh, uh, the problem with that is that now why do we require this five centimeter? That is most important, right? Why do we require? Because because uh, the magnet the homogeneity of the magnet is for this five this magnet homogeneity is for this 5 cm we are paying you know that nma cost a lot of money why do we require that uh, cost it is for the magnet and of course the spectrometer also cost now very big but the magnet itself is the major chunk of the uh, cost and that is for creating a homogeneous magnetic field of around 5 cm okay a homogeneous magnetic field of 5 cm Uh, we have to pay crores of rupees. So this is a typical NMR room. That we this is not our room. This is we, we don't have an 800. Uh, we have a 700 here. Uh, so this is a typical NMR room. This you see is the magnet. Okay, this is where the uh, the magnet is. Um, you see a lot of wires going in. This is a cryo probe. That is where there is a cryo platform around here. Okay, forget about the cryo platform. This is called a pre amplifier. Uh, this is called a preamplifier we'll come to all of this this is a spectrometer okay where all the pulsing receiving and and everything happens of course there should be somewhere else uh, uh, um a person sitting there with um a computer okay which will control everything so a computer connects to the spectrometer a spectrometer then connects to the uh, probe which is going in okay the it is uh, there is also some connection to the magnet but that is only for monitoring purposes okay okay so this is a, a movie from bruca uh, you can see how bruca this is a 950 ultra shielded ultra stabilized that is the u s squared this is a probe as i told you this is a sample spinner sample tube okay and then it goes on the top you see that it goes on the top it basically comes down it will come down it comes down and sits in sits in the probe the probe comes from the bottom and you see the, the other two are the nmr uh, that is a magnet that is there okay this is a radio frequency inside a radio frequency coil inside the probe and inside uh, the magnetic uh, tube you can have your nuclei right so uh, this is what uh, happens now let's go into detail now you see how big the coil now this thing here this is like a whole cylinder there is a bore that runs from the top to bottom there is a bore that runs from the top to bottom 
the everything else is around the bore okay everything else is around the bore this bore is in the room temperature okay it's, it will be in the room temperature whatever temperature that you're going to give okay that will be in the room temperature that a bore will go from top to bottom the probe that means where we supply the radio frequency and we receive the signal this is like an antenna in our older uh, tv thing right the probe is like a an antenna for our old tv uh, so that goes from the bottom and fixes here in the bottom okay and um, the the magnet the magnet is a solenoid that is wound around this bore huh? that is wound around in this bore and that is immersed i told i told you that is a superconducting coil superconducting coil and that is immersed in helium liquid helium so it will be either nine uh, uh, below nine kelvin nine kelvin okay nine kelvin this is then surrounded by a vacuum which is then immersed in liquid nitrogen okay liquid nitrogen okay that is uh, uh, that is 170 kelvin okay so this is where we have that is minus 100 degrees celsius right so this is where uh, this is how this is so uh, the, the, these cryogens we need liquid helium and liquid nitrogen uh, as the two cryogens of um, bottom thing and liquid helium is where in the liquid helium is where you have superconducting coil around it okay these are the filling ports nitrogen filling port are to the lower side so these guys here are filling nitrogen so he is taking this this is a transfer line from the nitrogen dvar goes up here and this is the exhaust there are two exhaust this is for broker there are two exhaust that comes up okay so you have to keep the exhaust because the pressure build up will be very high so we have to open up the exhaust so that uh, uh, the gases go the over pressure leaves so you uh, you apply uh, so you you put this transfer line into a liquid nitrogen and then it comes here it goes into here and the excess pressure and the liquid nitrogen comes out on the other side okay and finally when you uh, when the filling is over you get liquid nitrogen coming out here previously gases only will come before the filling when liquid nitrogen comes there is a spurting <laughs> spurting that means liquid is coming out then you stop the filling okay and do this similarly liquid um, um uh, uh, liquid helium port are on top here so you have to fill up here your transfer line goes up here okay here and then you have to open up this region here you see that that region not these these are pressure valves don't open that okay this region here and don't start here filling liquid helium when i uh, because i have gone through this seminar okay you should require some experience doing it so because liquid helium you have to do it you cannot keep opening keep it open for long time because before if you keep it open liquid helium is really light it will escape liquid helium cannot be found in the atmosphere why you know why because it is so light it escapes the atmosphere it gravity pull okay so atmospheric pull so it will escape into space okay so where do we get liquid helium from i mean where do we get helium from helium gas is trapped in the soil in the in the uh, earth uh, so when they drill for oil that is in the gulf countries and all uh, gulf russia or uh, america there they extract helium okay when they extract helium when they extract petrol this helium is also being extracted which is then liquefied put in the pressure and liquefied and then we get it okay so the temperature of the liquid helium is around 4 kelvin for kelvin so handling it also is really really nasty and if you open this open this uh, thing and keep it open for long time then liquid helium is going to evaporate and you are going to quench or you are going to uh, demagnetize your uh, superconducting coil so you should be really fast when you are going to fill liquid helium all right so okay this is just a, uh, the the uh, cross section of this enamel tube that i have told you so you have the liquid helium pot okay which is on the top liquid nitrogen is on the bottom okay so uh, and uh, liquid nitrogen is this uh, pink color liquid helium is here and you see this bore run the me that is in the room temperature the sample sits here the probe comes on from the bottom okay this coil is in liquid helium okay the magnetic coil or the the b0 field the magnet the superconducting magnet which gives the b0 field that is in the um uh, that is in the uh, 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 liquid helium path 
right so uh, this coil that i said which is a solenoid which is a solenoid is made up of uh, for less than 10 tesla that is most of it is uh, mri magnet it is made up of niobium titanium alloy and uh, the one uh, about 10, uh, 10 tesla it is mainly made up of niobium tin titanium uh, tin uh, alloy then now there are magnesium bor boride boron something uh, alloy also coming up which is less expensive it seems and very uh, versatile uh, superconducting uh, wires so these are wires this is the uh, this is the cross section of the wire and that is made of either niobium titanium or niobium tin for less, greater than 10 tesla okay and that is wound very specifically so that you get a uh, homogeneous magnetic field for 5 cm okay the winding how it is wound that is a proprietary thing either broker or all these magnetic people magnet people have oxford had it i guess uh, which is then give, given to uh, a broker uh, then geol has it uh, varian used to have it i think varian and broker basically got it from oxford i think uh, now the the type of uh, thing and they probably are developing it much higher these are the companies who makes high high end magnetic uh, fields so the winding, how it is wound, it is not uh, like our uh, motor winding, right? You can uh, wind it up. I mean, you require some skill in even, even winding that, okay? But here the winding has to be a little more precise because we need exactly five centimeter of homogeneous magnetic field. Why do we require homogeneous ma magnetic field? It's because we, uh, the the frequency, gamma B0, right? That is a frequency that is required. You know, remember the old uh, thing, gamma B0, that that. B, the gamma B, the frequency depends on the B0 magnetic field. And sample, if the frequency is different at different places in, in your sample point, then they will all. So, for example, a single species will have multiple uh, single nucleus in the same environment will have multiple uh, signal depending on the position where it is in the sample. That is not what that is not desirable. A single nucleus in a particular chemical environment should give you a single peak. Right, so that is why the uniqueness of an MR. And if you have multiple peaks, then you have a problem. Well, it is actually good for MRI, but not for uh, high resolution NMR. Uh, so uh, this is again the actual spectrometer and how uh, they are made up of. You see all this. Uh, uh, okay. What is this called? This uh, silvery stuff. This is this is these are all reflective to reduce the thermal heat getting inside because uh, helium are very expensive. You don't have to fill every day or something like that. Liquid nitrogen, on the other hand, we have to fill every week, which is less expensive uh, compared to liquid helium. Liquid helium we fill every three months or four months, uh, so that uh, but then. Uh, we have to make sure that it is well protected from outside environment, outside temperature, because there is a temperature gradient of almost 273 Celsius, I mean 273 degree, right? So uh, that temperature gradient uh, has to be maintained in order to not to evaporate uh, helium. So this has to be well protected. It's a big flask, a very well made flask, I can say. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, this is what it is. The helium, uh, there is a liquid nitrogen jacket, helium jacket, the magnetic field, the sample sits here, the probe comes from the bottom. Um, the field homogeneity, as I told you, uh, if you have um, uh, bad chimps, uh, if, you, uh, if, if the field homogeneity is maintained by what is called a shimming, a shimming is certain uh, uh, other coils in the magnet, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the bore of the magnet, uh, which are uh, which we change, which we pass current, such that even after paying so much of money, we will not probably get the exact five centimeter of very homogeneous magnetic field. If you have bad magnetic, uh, I mean, if the if the uh, homogeneity is bad, then you will get signal like that. It will decay very fast. Your free induction decay, uh, decay very fast. If you have good homogeneity, your free induction decay is going to last long, and you get a very sharp signal. Okay, so that is what uh, happens. So what we do in an MR is what we call a shimming. A shimming, a shimming is a name for it. It is to uh, homogeneous your magnetic field. 
so basically what is what uh, it has that there is some unharmonic field in your uh, um, in your magnetic field it will be, it will able to map that by using uh, a different technique and then we apply uh, in, in the coil will apply the shim coils will apply a current which will match this in the opposite direction okay okay in the opposite direction so it will subtract basically it will subtract it out so you'll get a root homogeneity like this okay so this is what shimming does into the sample okay so this is uh, the entire thing so uh, you have uh, this is for some other things but you can see uh, forget about this for all shims and uh, other things um, your sample uh, shuttle sample and all forget about that you your probe your superconducting magnet it goes to a preamplifier which is then connected to a amplifier uh, sorry uh, um, um, to a um, uh, console which is the nmr uh, spectrometers so what is nmr spectrometer consist of nmr spectrometer consist of the nmr console the preamplifier and the probe okay this whole three component this 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 there is also the temperature unit which i am missing but uh, the, all three units will come this is called this is called the bcu okay bcu uh, uh, or uh, if this is in the broker nomenclature or some cooling unit that is there so you have the console, an MR console, the preamplifiers, and then the probe with the temperature unit uh, is the whole spectrometer for the an MR. Then this is the magnet separately. Okay, so how does this work? Now this works with the probe like this. This is, oops, sorry, something happened. Uh, a probe which is connected to a RF detector which is then connected to a digitizer, which is connected to computer uh, bus program and the RF source, which is then connected to a computer, which is computer is then connected to a screen. So what is this? This the whole, uh, this RF detector is basically your, uh, uh, you, there is a de detector in the, there's a coil inside the probe that de de detects the NMR signal. You know, when the magnetic moment comes into the XY plane, there is this coil that is basically, uh, there is a coil that is inside the probe that sees the uh, current, which is passed on to the preamplifier, which is basically the detector part. And then, which is then digitized inside the NMR console. Uh, there is an ADC, analog to digital converter digitizer, which is then passed on to computer for processing. That is Fourier transform and everything is done by the computer, which is then displayed onto a screen. Okay. The other thing is there is a gradient uh, pulse programmer. So how do we then program? How do we put um, RF um, radio frequency inside? We program a pulse sequence. We program a pulse sequence. There should be a RF source, which is easily now made using uh, because our NMR thing things have have lower frequency. You know, the our gradient. Uh, uh, you can see that our um, uh, FM radios and all. So there the source is, you can digitize, you can digitize, there is a small clock inside which can have the uh, right frequency, which can they, which they can mix to have the 500, uh, if, if one is measuring at the 500 on a proton, 500 megahertz, 500 megahertz on a proton frequency, uh, then the carbon frequency, oh no, sorry, 400 megahertz on a uh, 400 megahertz, then the car uh, carbon frequency would be one by fourth of that because the gamma gyromagnetic ratio of carbon is one by fourth. So the uh, processional frequency or the resonance frequency of carbon 13 would be 100 megahertz. Okay, so we this RF source is basically a digital clock which creates this, um, this uh, frequency, okay, which can add up or subtract, whether it needs to be 400 megahertz or whether it needs to be 100 megahertz, you can, you you know, you can multiply and you can add and things like that. Uh, and then it goes to a pulse programmer, which is basically a timing device, which is basically a timing device, a gating device, as I told you, right? How a pulse is generated, it's a gating device, okay? Then it goes to a RF amplifier. Now it has to have the right power. Okay, you can create different shapes also of the pulses, but then it goes to an RF ampl amplifier, which power, how much power you want to put. That means the amplitude of your pulse, amplitude of your pulse. Okay, and then that goes into the probe. Okay, that is then connected to the probe. All right, and then the probe 
there is a different route the signal receives from the same coil it goes to the uh, preamplifier then it comes to the digitizer and then comes to the computer which then comes to the screen okay now this is a probe of your uh, uh, nmr spectrometer and the whole probe would look like this it is really long it's um, around half a meter possibly uh, um, and then um, this is like an as i told you an antenna okay and this is this will have different channels you see this this is a deuterium channel this is a proton channel this is a carbon 13 channel and this is a 15n channel okay this is what is called a triple channel triple txi or triple resonance probe triple resonance probe txi it's a, it's, on, it's for a 750 megahertz you cannot put a a, 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 a probe which is for a 400 megahertz on a 700 megahertz uh, NMR. The coil has to be tuned to certain frequencies, right? Because if you, the magnet basically determines what frequencies it will have. So, for example, a 700 would be 16.74 Tesla or something like that. Huh? 16.74 Tesla would be a 700 uh, uh, megahertz proton frequency, hydrogen uh, nucleus frequency. And in order to uh, resonate there, you need to have a probe specifically designed for that. You cannot have a probe designed for a 500 megahertz resonating uh, frequency and put it inside a 700 megahertz. That is not going to work. You have to have a very specific, this coil inside has to resonate at that particular frequency. Okay. Um, so you have the, so, so basically that is why uh, NMR is given uh, rather than, especially in chemistry, we don't give uh, the NMR the Tesla nomenclature. No, a 16.74 Tesla is not what we normally say for a 700 megahertz NMR. We say 700 megahertz NMR. Why is it? Because because that is the maximum frequency you can achieve in that spectrometer or in that spectrometer and that magnet in that magnet. Okay, you cannot achieve much more than that. So that is why it's uh, it's given. Anyway, so this particular probe is given TXI. The standard probes that comes with any standard chemistry thing is uh, a BBI or a broadband, uh, so BBO, broadband observe, where there are two coils, one inner RF coil and there is a outer RF coil. The inner RF coil would be more susceptible or more, more sensitive because it is very close to your sample. The sample, this is a sample tube, no? This is a spinner, this is a sample tube that sits in the cell. So the inner RF coil will be more closer to the sample. So this is more susceptible. So mostly what happens in a BBO probe is that you, you have this coil, this RF coil tuned to the X nuclei, X nuclei, which is the carbon nuclei or carbon-13 nuclei. So in, in organic chemistry or any normal NMR uh, chemistry laboratory, what people teach, uh, what people do is carbon-13 and proton NMR. Proton normally has a high sensitivity. Why? Because your gyromagnetic, I told you the M0 depends on the gyromagnetic ratio. Gyromagnetic ratio is really high, right? So, and its abundance is really high. So you don't have to have so much of uh, sensitivity for your protons. But on the other hand, carbon-13, Carbon-13 is not the natural isotope. That is only 1% of the total uh, uh, isotopes, uh, total carbons in your sample. So 1% and also gyromagnetic ratio is 1 by 4th of carbon. Okay, so your sensitivity is reduced already by 1 by 4th because of the gyromagnetic ratio. And on top of that, you're losing signal because there is no 100%, you have only 1% of carbon-13. So you want as much sensitivity for your carbon-13 compared to your proton. So why, what we do, we have this RF coil, inner RF coil tuned to carbon-13 or X nuclei, we call the X nuclei, and the outer coil tuned to only um, uh, proton or uh, hydrogen uh, nucleus. Okay, so hydrogen nucleus, this is called the uh, hydrogen nucleus. Okay, so this is happens th that one. Now, if you if you have a TXI probe, there will be three uh, coils, and that will be that will have different different uh, sensitivity, carbon thirteen and fifteen. Probably carbon thirteen and fifteen will be tuned to one particular frequency, and uh, and proton, of course, will be tuned uh, will have a different frequency. Right, and there is always there is always one other. Uh, thing that is the uh, deuterium. This is deuterium is for the long, and that channel will always remain open. 
so this is this is our uh, uh, nmr just is, is is like a radio now right a radio this is 93.5 fm this is uh, 108 uh, uh, anandapuri fm and this is uh, uh, well this is this is anandapuri fm and this would be uh, i think 94.7 big fm huh? so all this have different frequencies and you have to go into that frequency in order to observe it you will not be able to doing proton you will not be able to see carbon 13 i mean pulsing on proton or detecting on proton will not uh, carbon 13 uh, signals will not come okay so it is not uh, going to be able to see carbon 13 signal. right so uh, that is one and there is also of course there is some you see a uh, bottom there is something called tuning props because we need to exactly match and tune the right uh, frequency because again if the matching and tuning to the right frequency i told you it is these are capacitors huh? these are capacitors the tune capacitor and the matching capacitors and uh, in old radio uh, radio uh, radio radios we used to turn the knob to cut the right frequency in order to match the uh, the receiver antenna to the receiver signal this is what we are doing here also we are trying to match the when we when we tune when we match and tune this these uh, rods here which is now automated okay many of these nmr probes now have automated doing this like in our um, uh, digital uh, uh, radios now uh, so uh, we we tune and match uh, by turning these knobs the old radios also we used to tune we have to tune we have to get into am fm because of different frequencies and then we have to tune the radio such that you match uh, the right frequency when it's the right frequency it is ready for resonance okay so that is what happens so you have to tune and match what are we tuning and matching we are tuning and matching the resonant uh, coil frequency uh, with uh, the 600 or 500 whatever the uh, resonance frequency for the uh, nuclei right so um, uh, as i told you uh, you have this probe which is connected to a preamplifier a preamplifier which is then connected to us so this is a geol uh, setup okay which is a, uh, which is then connected to a uh, spectrum uh, nmr console which is then connected to the computer and screen so this is a broker uh, thing which i found out so uh, the broker preamplifier you see many many uh, 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 screws uh, going here here the channel you no know, the output from these channels that comes out of the probe goes into this okay so uh, when when you are detecting or when you are pulsing the uh, the the uh, the pulses goes through this 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 cable connects this cable this uh, the, uh, the the cable from here from the amplifier gets connected on the other side of the uh, preamplifier and the output from this side of the preamplifier gets connected to the probe here okay so you see there are there are wires or cables coming from the probe to the preamplifier and from the preamplifier to the console okay now where is this preamplifier pre preamplifier sits between the console and the probe why do we require a preamplifier because of the signals that we get are very very weak very very weak by in millivolt or things like that and we need uh, even smaller actually uh, and we need at least to amplify it because by the time this signal travels from this here to this console here it would have dissipated and you will your sensitivity will be lost okay there will be so much of resistance going through these wires right so you need to preamplify you have to amplify all the amplification can be done here but at least we need to get it up a little bit up before it is uh, uh, sent to the uh, amplifier amplifiers or our signal generating unit and now previously uh, these distances used to be like uh, like 300 to 100 meters and things like that because your magnet is very highly magnetic you are you are using a high magnetic field uh, and this magnetic field has a very high uh, it can magnetize any any electronic component nearby you know and uh, we have to keep the console and the preamplifier away uh, at least preamplifier is uh, is closer but the uh, but the other part of the console has to be separated out okay uh, i i i got sorry um 
I will finish in another 10, uh, 10 minutes if that is not possible. Uh, so uh, it, will go, it goes from here to here and then to here. Um, so um, I told you RF generation happens in the console. RF radio frequency generation happens in the console. This is then amplified by an amplifier which is then fed to the preamplifier. Preamplifier, when it the RF in, when, when the RF goes into the probe uh, for pulsing, then uh, yeah, then you don't have to do any preamplifier. So there is a switch that uh, that toggles between the uh, between the transmitting pass and receiving uh, receiving part. Okay, the receiving everything goes here while the transmitting transmitting meaning uh, uh, pulsing goes in these uh, cables here. Okay, the transmitting the receiving parts comes here. So this top part of the uh, preamplifier is for the receiver. And this bottom part is for the transmitting. That means pulsing part. Okay. Uh, uh, now this is a amplifier. Eh? Amplifier, which basically amplifies one of each of each one of this will cause around ten lakhs. This is like your amplifier in your uh, uh, in your. Uh, this is like eh? this is like your amplifier uh, if you have a sound system. Okay. That basically amplifies your signal and uh, puts it to a very high uh, tempo. So uh, each amplifier will have its own uh, thing. This is called, uh, this, is, uh, this is for example, two, 2000 watt amplifier. Uh, 2000 watt, there are two of them. There is 300 watt amplifier. Uh, this has two output. One, uh, in one, from one output, it gives you 2000 watt amplifi amplification. And this is a 300 watt amplifier amplification, okay? Uh, um, each, uh, each nucleus, each channel, does not require so much of power. The from the proton, it requires around 50 watt ampli amplification. For um, uh, for carbon 13 and carbon 15, somewhere around 150 to 200 watt amplification is required for uh, uh, for the pulsing. I'm talking about the pulsing. You no, know, the amount of power required to uh, take the um, uh, take the magnetic moment from the z direction to x or y direction. Right, so um, so this 2000 watt amplification and etc. is required for solid state NMR. Okay, this high 2002k watt amplifier is required for, is for solid state NMR. This is not really required for our uh, solution uh, NMR. This is a fan that basically cools on. It gets really hot uh, for this uh, ampli ampli amplifier to work. Um, so uh, this out output from this the cable from this goes into the preamplifier on the other side of the uh, preamplifier. Other side, there will be cables like this. It will be on the other side also. Okay, uh, and that will each uh, each of this tower, each of this this is one piece. Huh? The second piece, third piece, fourth piece, and fifth piece. Each of this tower corresponds to one channel. Okay, one channel either to carbon thirteen because you can't you can't connect carbon thirteen to proton. That is not going to happen. Okay, that should not happen. Carbon thirteen, they should have a dedicated preamp. Uh, module for carbon 13. There will be. There should be a dedicated preamp module for uh, proton. There should be a dedicated preamp module for 59. Carbon 13 or X nuclei. Okay, if it is a two uh, two double resonance probe, that means you can only have two channels. Okay, uh, double resonance means you can simultaneously pulse in two two channels. That is what called a double resonance probe is. Huh? So you cannot do triple resonance on a double resonance probe. That is very important. You cannot do triple resonance in a double resonance probe unless, of course, the two you are talking about are carbons. But if you if you want to do proton, carbon, and nitrogen, they have different frequencies. Okay, They are very different frequencies. Then you cannot simultaneously pulse in all three uh, together on a double resonance probe. You have to have a triple resonance probe. Okay, so in for protein and amount, triple resonance probe is what we require. Anyway, so this this is the signal generation of the whole thing. It, this is Brooker nomenclature. You have a pulse programmer. Now it is uh, it is uh, it is basically uh, given by what is called an IPSO. It's basically a small computer that is con uh, that is controlling all the rest of the thing, including the probe. The, um, uh, the BCU, the preamplifier, uh, the amplifier, everything that is basically controlled by the uh, a small computer, CCU or IPSO, that we call. That also generates now adds up generating the RF radio frequencies. Also, this will con then convert it to the SU, which will give you how much power is required, and that basically 
power required that's basically uh, it, it gives you in millivolt which will then actually put it into power by the amplifier this is the amplifier the cable then connects to the preamplifier you see this is one of, one of the modules these are three modules here okay in the module here the output of that will go through a filter but now most of the filter this if it's a dedicated preamplifier then the filter is not required otherwise what is happening is a low pass filter a low pass or high pass filter where um, uh, you are um, uh, where any any frequencies that comes out which is uh, which is above the threshold or below the threshold is discarded and that is only being sent to your uh, probe okay so the receiver also comes through like that the receiver comes and goes to the top of the preamplifier which goes to one of the sgus not to amplifier it goes to directly to the sgu which is then which is called the dru digital receiver unit which converts the analog to a digit that basically has a digital uh, analog to a digital converter which then uh, this digitized the signal digitized meaning you uh, it's a points now it's zero and twos uh, these points are then fed to a computer and the computer then uh, do the fourier transform all right so this is how all the important parts of a uh, of a um, uh, nmr is uh, each of this cost a huge amount of time uh, money for example a probe cost around uh, 25 lakhs uh the spectrometer themselves cost around uh, 1 crore or 1.5 crores uh, uh, depending at the simplest of them uh, cost amount that okay i hope i have given you a basic idea about how these things are it is not so unless we actually show you it's not actually uh, possible i thank you for your kind attention if there are questions uh, so th th thank you very much dr vinesh for the very informative talk so i think there is a, a discussion part uh, we may continue tomorrow afternoon oh, because uh, this yeah kcst people they are starting another conference right now okay 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 sure yeah so uh, to the participants also you please uh, ask questions tomorrow in the afternoon uh, the, we have enough time to discuss i i have detail. i have some i am some uh, questions here i just copy yeah. it into my uh, maybe tomorrow i will uh, yeah please please, uh, please. Uh, do that yeah. Huh? yeah yeah thank you thank you okay. so thank you very much very for this very informative talk okay thank you very much for listening yeah. to me yeah thank you